for the first message this morning, Mr. Brian Paul. Thank you, Ms. Boloroski. Good morning, brethren. Good morning. Good morning. Let's get started this morning. I'll go ahead and give you a uh, title. Get your minds moving on it on the subject. The title is Human Division or Godly Unity. That is Human Division or Godly Unity. That's kind of a big topic we've seen here lately. Because here in the past recent weeks, it's kind of been hard to even turn our TVs on and enjoy a program without seeing a world in such disarray and turmoil over personal views of the heritage of this country and the people who live in it. We've moved from a nation that has tried to seek healing to a country divided by protest, acts of destruction by those who have their own ideas of equality and peace. These ideas and actions have brought about nothing but utter chaos and pure hate toward fellow mankind. You know, in the beginning, God was the one who divided man. But he divided them into groups of nations, religious practices, family heritage, and even language. It took man's own ideas to separate and divide by skin color, hair textures, and facial features, for example. So when we see these types of attitudes that are displayed on TV, when it's got the hate and all that's running around wild in our communities, how does it make you feel? You know, it's hard to be honest does anyone in here get angry? Did we lose our temper, lose our train of thought, get reeled into this? And not, not losing it and being actively engaged in it, but are we allowing it to change our attitudes? Expressing ideas and opinions that are not godly. You know, I know I have. I'm pretty sure many of us all have. Because, you know, if we don't recognize this, then we run the risk of allowing this to become ingrained in our very own nature and it's going to be caused problems in our families if not left unchecked if it's left unchecked we can run the risk of sowing discord among the brethren you know allowing hate and fear to divide us it can cause two great evils it can separate ourselves from god and second it can halt the growth and progress of a church as we prepare as the bride of christ we're not going to turn there and read it but a good example of this problem can be found in numbers 12 remember it's when Miriam had a simple attitude toward Moses about his wife. When with most situations you know rose around Moses, Christ dealt with that pretty swiftly, very harshly. Most of the time it was death. But in this case here, it seems that Christ dealt with a specific issue, the skin. Miriam not only had to suffer physically and emotionally, but she was put outside the camp in isolation for seven days for her behavior. Not only was she punished, but that separation, but her sin caused the entire camp to wait. What blessings did she cause that camp to miss in those seven days? And even today, you know, those same attitudes at that time are running wild throughout the world. And if we are not careful, they could even be brought amongst us here in the church. Are we to blame for the lack of progression of our congregation? It's something to think about. This morning, I want to look at how the Apostle Paul addressed roughly this same issue, but it was a little different, but it was the attitude of superiority, of social status that migrated into the temple that caused the vision. Then I want to quickly discuss three areas of the body where we can help avoid dividing the body of Christ. So if you would, please join me this morning in uh, Ephesians chapter 2. We'll begin here. Let's look at the situation where Paul addressed this Gentile church. And I mean, he's dealing with divisions. Divisions that was caused by different attitudes and ideas in the Jewish community. In Ephesians 2, let's read verses 13 through 15. But now in Christ Jesus, you once, who were once far off have been made near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who has made both one and has broken down the middle wall of division between us, having abolished in his flesh the enmity, that is, the law of the commandment, contained in or ordinances, so as to create in himself one new man from the two, thus making peace. You know, as you read that, 
in the scriptures, you know, one question may pop up. What middle wall or division or separation had to be broken down? So this reconciliation to the one body could take place. In verse 15, Paul describes this wall as enmity. It divided the Jews and the Gentiles. Unfortunately, today some men would teach that this wall is God's law. His own commandments. But here, in this manner, it's not the case. Paul's not even referring to the law of God. Although many places in the Bible where you do see the words law and commandments, we are referring to the laws of God. But in this case, it's the Greek word entole. And that's number Strong's word 1785, which roughly means the precepts of a Jewish tradition. And it's also tied to the Greek word entoma, which means the negative effects of fallen an ill-advised plan. So to understand the wall Paul is referring to, you have to remember who his audience was, who he was speaking to. This was a Gentile people who would have used physical events or man-made objects here to bring about a spiritual understanding and knowledge to those who desire to grow and learn in Christ. So the wall in verse 14 is exactly what Paul was describing. It's also a Greek word, mesotokin, which means a physical wall. And that word in verse 14, division is phragmos, means hedge or fence that separates and prevents two from coming together. If you look back in history, Paul was referring to a barrier built to the Jewish leaders at the Jerusalem temple. He was called using that barrier as comparison to the divisions that the Jews had developed because of human standards. A belief that they were more righteous before God. And if Paul was able to use this as a spiritual lesson to show how Christ broke down the visions even before the destruction in 70 AD by the Romans. And it's nice to know that those folks that was there being taught by Paul, when they seen this destruction, they was able to look and see as that symbol of ethnic and religious barriers that had been erected and were torn down. But that's all by selfish human nature. That's why it's so important to see these barriers for what they are, not allowing our outside influence to corrupt our minds and divide us from the peace and unity that Christ died for. It's our responsibility as members of the body of Christ to protect our minds from man-made divisions of culture, race, religion, and nationalities. And until these barriers are broke down forever by Christ, we need to pay attention to these areas so we, so we can look and seek ways to keep our minds focused on God's plan. So I want to quickly share with you three areas we can use to help avoid being divided by evil worldly issues. The first one is learn to control our thoughts and emotions. Learn to control our thoughts and emotions. As mentioned earlier, what we see can have a major impact on how we act and how we live. We are constantly bombarded with evil worldly issues today. And if we're not careful, it can easily cause us to forget who and what is behind it. And I know as American citizens living in this great country, we tend to hold on to certain things. You know, we classify them as sacred. Things that remind us of our past. Such things as flags, you know, memorials of wartime that remind us of the cost of freedom, the cost of where we come, how far we've come as a nation. Some of these memorials may remind us of bad times in history, but they also keep us focused on moving forward and to learn from where we came from. Sadly, many people refuse to see it that way and are bent on causing opposition, desiring change at the cost of ignorance because they don't understand the truth of what they're opposing because they refuse to study history and to understand the opposition. So as we see the destruction of these physical objects, we shouldn't allow it to control our emotions to the point of lowering ourselves to their level, of losing our tempers, to getting upset. What we as members of the family of God should hold on to is the words of God. In 2 Peter 3, verses 10 through 13, we're not turning there, but it states that Christ's return, the heaven and earth and the physical things of it will melt away. So what should we be holding on to? It's not physical objects or ideas, but rather the truths and the laws of God. The things that last forever and the bringer of true peace. Remembering what is important will not allow our adversary to infiltrate our minds by our sight and cause these divisions. Let's turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 10. Sounds 
house where Mary was in Mr. Martin's email. Second Corinthians chapter 10. Sweet verses 3 through 6. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God for pulling down strongholds, casting down arguments and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, and bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ, and in being ready to punish all disobedience with your obedience is fulfilled. Controlling our thoughts and emotions is the first steps to breaking down the vision. And reading here, we will be held accountable for those as well. The second area is develop a proper fear. Develop proper fear. God doesn't want us to live in continuous terror. But on the other hand, our adversary does, and he deals in this type of mind control. As human beings, you know, we're naturally fear anything that is physically and emotionally threatening. We also tend to fear anything that is greater or different from ourselves. And if this is left uncontrolled, it can, can grow until we let it control our lives with irrational thoughts, emotions, and even bad behaviors. In today's society, we see this fear based on self-preservation and greed because of this unhealthy type of fear. This unhealthy type of fear only leads to division. Many of you may recognize this, but there's a famous saying from a character in a movie series called Star Wars. His name was Yoda. But he coined the phrase, fear is the path to the dark side. Fear leads to anger. Anger leads to hate. And hate leads to suffering. Now, this statement could not be more true than to issues that we're seeing today that are warring in our own communities. So to battle this fear, we as the children of God must develop this proper fear that was intended by our Father. It brings unity. This fear is based upon the overwhelming awe and reverence of a righteous and holy God. And no, not the type of fear that is only motivated to bring about obedience, only out of fear of punishment, but rather the desire to develop qualities that reflect the love that our Father so graciously shows to us. It's the character he wants in his children. Turn to uh, 1 John 4. Let's see, this, the writer of this scripture, he kind of explains it a little bit more in detail. It's 1 John 4, and we're going to read verses 16 and 18. And I'm going to read this out of the Amplified Bible. It's 1 John 4, verse 16. And we know, understand, recognize, and are conscious of by observation and experience and believe, adhere to, and put faith in and rely on the love God cherishes for us. God is love, and he who dwells and continues in love dwells and continues in God. And God dwells and continues in Him. And the key scripture, verse 18, there is no fear in love. Dread does not exist, but full grown, perfect love turns fear out of doors and expels every trace of terror. For fear brings with it the thought of punishment. And so he who is afraid has not reached full maturity of love and has not yet grown into love's complete perfection. This type of godly fear, you know, the love, the wisdom, comes by reverencing God and it leads us toward perfection. And this type is identified by our Father as almost non-existent today in this society. And the lack of all respect of our Creator cannot be allowed to infiltrate our minds and turn and in turn enter into the congregations of God's church. Third point or area is see the world through God's eyes. See the world through God's eyes. If you remember the story of Samuel, as he was going to anoint another king over Israel when when uh, Saul had been rejected, you remember as he walked up. And one of Jesse's sons run up. He said, surely this is the Lord's anointing. He didn't know that Christ had refused him. But Christ stated, the Lord does not see man as man sees. For man looks at the outward appearance and God looks at the heart. It's a good thing to think about. There's no way I want God to see me as man does. 
to only compare me to the physical features of Christ, but rather see Christ's attributes in me, what He came, what His Word, what He designed for mankind to be. Because if it was another way, then we would all be rejected. So first, when we begin to control our thoughts and emotions, and we step back with that proper fear intended by God, with love and peace that's within us, we can see who and what is behind these evil demonstrations, the ones building these barriers of chaos and confusion. It's only looking through God's eyes that we'll be able to recognize these barriers that need to be eliminated, barriers that prevent and separate people contrary to the Word and the plan of God. Let's turn to Galatians 3. Galatians 3, and let's read verses 26 through 28. It's Galatians 3, verses 26 through 28. For you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of you as were baptized in Christ have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is neither male nor female. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. It all boils down to two things. There's two groups. You're either for me or you're against me. There's no middle ground. If we choose to make a middle ground and try to play that middle ground, then we're going to run the risk of being put outside the camp. Possibly rough correction and missing out on great blessings intended by God. Up to and including possibly missing out on becoming part of His first fruits. So we need to see evil for what it is and look at it through our Creator's eyes. So in closing, we must choose to see that by allowing ourselves to be pulled into this man-made ethnic, gender, and culture, cultural prejudices. We are the ones putting that barrier that is standing in the way of peace and unity between God and man. For well, final scripture, let's turn to Colossians 2. Colossians 2 we're going to read verse 8. Colossians 2, verse 8. Beware lest anyone cheat you through philosophy and empty deceit according to the traditions of men, according to the basic principles of the world, and not according to Christ. These non-biblical ideas that are rooted in human tradition are some of the same issues that Paul had to face in his time. And like those of his time, we as members of the family of God must make that decision on how we want to live. We either want to be immersed in human division that only leads and brings forth hate and suffering, or choose to live the way that God has intended for His creation to dwell since the beginning of time, and that is in the unity that is in Christ.